Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you're most welcome today to our presentation. Uh, I apologize for some technical difficulties at the start that were a little bit delayed. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you to this IIA webinar, which is part of our, our IIA Global Europe project supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs. And I'm particularly uh, delighted to welcome uh, State Secretary, Mr. Christian Danielson, uh, the Swedish State Secretary for EU Affairs. Um, Mr. Danielson, we appreciate greatly your joining us at what we are aware is a very busy time for the EU uh, Swedish presidency. So uh, our sincere thanks to you for being with us. Um, you'll be able to join, uh, State Secretary Danielson will speak to us for about 20 minutes uh, or so, and then we'll go to question and answer with uh, our audience. Uh, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, which you should see on your screen. And please feel free to send your questions uh, in during the session, and we will come to them once uh, State Secretary Danielson has finished his presentation. Uh, just also a reminder that today's presentation and the Q&A are on the record. And also please feel free to join on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Uh, we're also live streaming this morning's discussion. So very warm welcome to all of you who are joining via YouTube. The Swedish presidency is occurring at a very difficult time, a pivotal time, of course, for the union especially in the context of the seismic upheavals of the war in Ukraine, uh, the challenges to competitiveness um, of the single market from China, with China and the US, uh, and many other uh, difficulties that have arisen. Of course, the tragic natural disaster in Turkey and Syria is also placing a strain on international relations. Uh, the Swedish presidency has laid out very clear priorities in terms of security, competitiveness, green energy transition, and democratic values and uh, the rule of law. And they're in great detail in the presidency program uh, with strong commitments to carry these forward. And we look forward to uh, the State Secretary uh, taking us through the view from the Swedish presidency at this stage. May I introduce uh, State Secretary Danielson? I think it's true to say that there are very few people in Europe, as State Secretary, have such a view of Europe, both from inside and from outside. Um, the State Secretary uh, is, uh, has previously served as Deputy Secretary General of the Commission, Director General of European Commission uh, for Neighborhood and Enlargement Negotiations, and also before uh, he was made State Secretary, head of the European Commission representation in Sweden. He also served in the cabinet uh, of, uh, as deputy head of cabinet for Vice President Verhoegen, where he dealt with Turkey and competitiveness. Uh, on the other side of the fence, uh, this State Secretary was in the Swedish Foreign Ministry during the first. Swedish presidency 2001 dealing with enlargement and then uh, during the second presidency in Brussels as um, permanent representative. So with that spread of experience, State Secretary, I hand you the floor and we greatly look forward to hearing from you today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much and uh, thank me. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. In fact, this is, a, I think, the second time that I appear in, in front of the of the Institute of International European Affairs. Uh, last time I was in Dublin, and I think uh, this must have been in 2003 or something, 2004, and, and the, the, the subject was enlargement. Now, different times, different, uh, different subjects. Uh, now it's a different Europe that we are in front of, and uh, as you rightly pointed out, for the Swedish presidency, it's, uh, and for the EU, I would say, it, it is fairly challenging times. We are now one and a half, close to, to one and a half months in, into the, the presidency. And um, a major part of it, to be honest, is, uh, is about uh, seeing to that the work continues. Uh, this is in the midst of the legislative uh, agenda of the European Union. So we have uh, uh, numerous uh, issues on the table where the expectation, and our wish, is to move that forward in order to see to that we are getting the legislation in place and getting the, 
the various instruments in place which are there in order to address challenges that the EU has in front of it. So that is, going, is, is a major part of the work now happening in Brussels with uh, numerous meetings. I just realized that there are about 350 files that are open. We're not going to address all of them. And uh, we have numerous meetings that, uh, that are going to take place down, down in Brussels, but also here in Sweden. That being said, we are also facing challenges which are substantial by themselves and which are putting quite a lot of influence over the agenda that we are, that we are addressing. And th the biggest one is the Russian aggression, the Russian war against, against Ukraine which is not just an aggression towards Ukraine, but it is an aggression against us, in a sense. The war that uh, Ukraine is fighting is, uh, is, in a sense, our war. It is a war about uh, protecting or defending democracy, defending rule of law and international law, and, uh, and also a, a, a war of standing up against that kind of aggression that we would have hoped would not exist in Europe. In, in the 21st century. Clearly, we have also a challenge when it comes to the economy and, uh, and the energy, which has been a major element here, uh, which is linked to the Russian aggression, uh, which has played up stronger than I think we, we would have wanted to see. And then on top of that, we very recently got this tragic event in uh, Turkey and Syria with the earthquake, which also uh, is putting challenges for us, particular challenges for the, for, for the people of Turkey and Serbia, but where the expectation is that we should stand up and help as much as we can from the European side. Now, that with those challenges being there, nevertheless, we have put down for these six months, as you rightly pointed to, four priorities. Uh, which we are trying to sort of set out what are the issues where we see most of the of the political um, uh, the political emphasis will be put into, and here they are they are if you if you if you take them in the order they come we say security clearly, we see competitiveness as being an important one, we see the green and the energy transition as the third one and the democratic values and the rule of law as the fourth one. Now, let me just turn then to, to the priority of security, which is primarily Russia's aggression towards Ukraine. And for us, it has not only been there to see to that, uh, and so we'll put like this, that the most important element for us has been to keep the unity of the European Union, which has been astonishing over this period. Keeping European unity when it comes to the support in concrete terms, that's humanitarian support. It is the economic support that is called for. It is right now as well, and has been since the beginning, the military support, but also the political perspective for Ukraine, for the future integration uh, with, with the EU. As, as, and, and Ukraine is a candidate country, so there is a process that will have to go on in that context. Now, uh, right now, what we are focusing on are three elements. One is the sanctions against Russia, uh, where the work is in a, in a final stage when it comes to the next sanction package, which should be in the table on the table for the 24th, which is on Friday, which is a commemoration, a tragic commemoration, but nevertheless a commemoration of one year of war. The second element that we are working hard on is, uh, is about uh, responsibility and see to that uh, the responsibility for the crimes that have been committed during this war, that that responsibility also falls on those who are responsible. And uh, that boils down to uh, very quite, quite difficult uh, issues relating to law, which is not only about the EU, but beyond the EU, because we're talking about international law here, but which nevertheless is an important element of what we also should do within the EU. And the third element is about the frozen assets, where we have set up a specific working group to work on it. Um, it's not easy 
I mean, one can easily say that it would be great if we can use the frozen assets for the recovery, for, for the reconstruction of Ukraine. But uh, there are also here important legal elements that needs to be taken into account. And this is exactly what we are working on right, right now. In addition to, uh, to the security link to the Russian aggression towards Ukraine, we have also put under that heading the important element of fighting organized crime, security of the EU internally, where I think we all, the member states, are sense, have the sense of it, national organized crime being an element that cannot be addressed only by national <laughs> measures and national instruments, but where the European cooperation plays an important role. And given the fact that we in Sweden over the last couple of years have seen a dramatic increase, in particular when it comes to international organized crime linked to gang violence, this has been something which we have a certain interest to see to that we can do what we can as a presidency to drive that, uh, that uh, issue forward. We have also under security put the element of migration uh, where we have seen over the last couple of months a, a substantive increase in uh, irregular migration into the EU, uh, primarily through the Western Balkan route, and uh, where therefore we have during the last couple of months have a substantive increase when it comes to uh, uh, seeing to how we can work together in strengthening the external borders of the European Union most recently at the European Council on the, on the 9th of February. And this is work which will continue to, to drive forward. And that we are doing in parallel with the important work on the Migration Pact, which is the long-term solution to, uh, to addressing the, the issue both of, of having a, a functional, well-functioning asylum policy, but also having a policy when it comes to migration which, uh, which takes into consideration the different elements, everything from irregular migration to legal migration. The second priority is competitiveness. And the background here is uh, the fact that Europe over the last 10, 15 years have been lagging behind major partners such as the United States, such as partners in Asia, I'm not thinking about China, when it comes to productivity and growth. And that part of that has a link to the way that uh, e the EU instruments, when it comes to single market and beyond, is functioning, and that we have identified improvements there as an important element in order to see to that European competitiveness is strengthened. And this is something which is broadly shared among the member states and also by the institutions. So we are looking forward already now in March, at the European Council in March, to be able to have a very rich discussion on what is called for in order to strengthen Europe's competitiveness, not only for the coming months, but in the longer term. And what we are landing on there is issues such as how the internal market become more functional. And what we're talking about there is standardization and also eliminating barriers uh, to uh, the free movement of the four freedoms that still exist or are being developed over the last couple of years. We are also, reflect, well, from our point of view, we are also seeing important element, an important element being the better regulation, namely to see to that we get the regulatory environment, which is uh, even more conducive towards growth while not uh, while not lowering ambitions when it comes to environment or, 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 or other legitimate reasons for having joint legislation. We're also thinking about innovation. We're thinking about research, strengthening the research, uh, the research um, um, community within the EU. And we are thinking about trade, as such, which is such an important uh, uh, player when it comes to, to uh, providing growth uh, for the EU. We should be aware that a substantive part of the growth that we can see globally over the coming years is going to be uh, in, in, in the areas, in, in geographical areas outside the EU. And where the way EU can, can integrate or can, can play a role in that, in that respect will also have a direct effect on our ability to create uh, prosperity 
and, and growth within the, within the European Union. So that, that is something we have put quite a lot of emphasis on. What has come in, which we did not see that clearly when we started to prepare our, our presidency, is the, the fallout of what is called ERA, Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, which on the one hand is something welcome, namely that the United States is back on the scene when it comes to fighting climate change. Uh, and but with, which also has a certain elements of it which uh, which leads to uh, neg- or risks leading to negative effects for European industry. So that is something where we have had to put quite a lot of emphasis over the last couple of, of weeks and months. And I think the European Union have found a way forward now, which is, uh, which is uh, the right way. It exists of a number of elements. One is uh, close cooperation with the United States trying to find ways and means to see to that those elements of ERA, which are risks having negative effect for European industry, that that one is being addressed in in some way or another in our bilateral relations with the United States. The other element, which is not, uh, should not be seen as a protectionist instrument, which, 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 because it's not, but which is addressing a fact, namely that we have reason to try to see to that environment for clean tech which is what ERA is about. In, within the EU, that environment becomes more conducive towards clean tech. That, that is the second element that, that, that now is being addressed, and which boils down to issues such as permitting, such as seeing to that the uh, provision of, of uh, raw materials is being uh, better taken care of, which also looks into issues relating to uh, the energy and the electricity, electricity pricing. Third element in respect to that kind of clean tech element, clean tech <laughs> that came out of the ERA discussion is about financing. It's true that for some areas there is a need for further financing of clean tech and uh, where state aid plays a role. And therefore there is, has been a quite substantive discussion on what that should look like. And there's one on the one hand state aid, very time limited and specified national such state aid for clean tech, but on the same time, EU instruments that already exist and funding that exist that also could be used for the same purpose. A further element is uh, the whole issue of skills that is called for for the development of, of clean tech. So this we have been working on over the last couple of, of weeks, and it's something that we also is going to continue to work on when it comes to competitiveness, and that will be important elements. Our third priority is the green and energy transition. And it goes without saying that uh, that is uh, very high on the agenda for all of us. It is about climate change, but it goes beyond climate change. It's also about biodiversity, and it's about the whole transition when it comes to becoming greener and even better addressing environmental challenges that are out there. It's clear that the Fit for 55 package, which is climate change primarily, is one of those areas where we are going to put lots of emphasis. A a substantive part of that was already addressed during the previous presidency, the Czech presidency. But we have a number of elements that needs to be addressed now and agreed upon now in order for that package to come to come to come together, and 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 starting to also play its full role, and it's important that that happens during the Swedish presidency, because otherwise there is an issue of timelines. The objective here is 55% reduction of greenhouse gases by 2030, and if we don't get the this legal uh, framework into place, then there is a risk that we will not be able, from the EU's point of view, to to fulfill that that clear objective that has been set. So we're going to work hard on that one. And uh, as it stands right now, I am pretty, how shall I say, I am cautiously optimistic that we will be able to deliver this one during the six months ahead of us. And then finally, we have the issue about democratic values and principles of law, uh, which which, uh, rule of law and, and democratic values being the the basis of what uh, the EU, which we stand on, and uh, and therefore so important, not only important from the point of view of 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 defending democracy and being able to project the, our system beyond the EU, uh, democracy, rule of law, 
the right of minorities, uh, but also important and for the citizens within the EU, but also important for the EU system to work and to function. We are a, a union of law and a Swedish court or an Irish court when being when when um, having to take a stand on issues which are related to European law is the European court. And therefore the system must, must work and there must be, be, be full confidence in that this is exactly what is going to happen and that is how it will function. Now it's clear that uh, over the last couple of years there have been identified deficiencies in the system in terms of, in particular, two countries, Poland and Hungary. And we will continue our presidency to work on that and help those countries to come back and fully, fully be sort of fully, fully live up to the conditions that are called for, for, for creating that kind of confidence in their, in their legal system. But we will also uh, work in, in order to, to keep that whole issue on the agenda. And we will have certain, certain manifestations of it in terms of, uh, of uh, a, a symposium in June, which we, on rule of law, which we will hope will, will sort of lead to further steps in the direction of strengthening this uh, within the cooperation in the EU. So there you have our, our four priorities. We will. We we are facing multiple crises. That's clear, uh, but it's also clear that we need the European cooperation more than ever. I think, and uh, I have a sense, and we have a sense that that is broadly shared by the member states. It's broadly shared by these by the European institutions, and uh, therefore we are fairly confident that uh, we are going to be able during this presidency to live up to the uh, to the expectations that are are on us. From from the member other member states, but also beyond beyond that, I think I stop here and open up for for questions or comments. Thank you very much indeed, Secretary. Um, that is a very comprehensive view. I think it's made clear to us the uh, extraordinary breadth of the challenges that you face uh, on a number of fronts, and um, your outline of the dossiers that are open, uh, even just to keep business as usual plus the, the serious challenges that are there. But thank you very much for giving us a, such um, a very clear expose of where the Swedish presidency and the direction you are working in. Uh, I have um, just a number of questions. Uh, you mentioned the first uh, priority uh, of your um, list is security and security and defense. And I note that in your uh, the detailed outline of your um, presidency program. Um, you said that uh, we must build robust European security and defence policy in close cooperation with partners, and you express strong support for the strategic compass. And I have a question from a uh, retired Brigadier General uh, Ahern, um, who uh, re his question basically is how does uh, Sweden uh, fund its armed forces so well. Uh, he mentions that uh, the Irish uh, defense forces suffer from underfunding because of, uh, budget is always necessary for education and health. And yet Sweden manages to uh, fund its, its defense forces. But basically, could I just ask you, uh, uh, how do you see uh, EU cooperation in the security and defense force going forward uh, during your presidency? Uh, because so much emphasis is based on NATO, but obviously there is a cooperation with NATO. But how do you envisage uh, during your presidency keeping the EU security and defence programme going as well? Yeah, no, it's an important issue. And I, I think I start from the compass. I think that one sets out fairly straightforward areas where EU has, an, has a complementary role to the to NATO, which of course is the major provider of of uh, of of, uh, of defense for for the allies. Now Sweden is not yet an ally, but uh, for those who are members, and we hope to be a member very very soon. Uh, so the compass sets out, a, I think, in a quite elaborate way where where we can work and should work more within the EU context. One is about the sort of new threats like cyber, like hybrid 
where uh, the fact that there were the EU with its uh, research competences, but also with other competences within the union, are able to provide a complementary role to uh, similar kind of activities going on within the NATO context. So that's one element. The second element is capacity. And, and that, that is capacity which has to do with uh, our EU's role, in particular when it comes to uh, operations such as uh, the one we have had in Georgia for many, many years in order to, to help monitoring the, the ceasefire situation there, or rather the situation in Georgia, or for that sake, any of the other, I think, uh, close to 15 or whatever it is today, operations that are underway where the compass sets out, we need to do that faster and we need to do it better. And I think that is something that we should work on. The third element has to do with the uh, defense industry and uh, where uh, within the EU, we have reason to try to become more efficient in, uh, in both the development, but also in the procurement of defense, of defense material. And here EU can play a role together. Right now, there is a piece of legislation underway on, on exactly that, on procurement. And the fourth element is about the cooperation with international organizations. So in all those strands, EU will continue to, to work and we, we are going to continue as the presidency to work and see to that those elements goes forward. But of course, what is overshadowing all of this is uh, the war, uh, Russia's war against Ukraine, where the EU has taken a role in helping member states to, um, to finance the, uh, the military support to Ukraine through the peace facility, where in total, I think we have provided over 3 billion euros in, in, uh, in uh, defense financing or defense material from, from member states. So that is one important element. And right now there is a discussion within the EU on whether we could do more, in particular when it comes to ammunition for, for Ukraine, which happens to be a difficult area uh, right now, and how we can see to that the producers in Europe can scale up in order to see to, to meet not only the demands of Ukraine, but also the demands of Europe's own security, given that quite a substantive part of the stocks of ammunition has now been delivered to Ukraine from many, many of the member states. So that is on the EU's role as such. And then the question was, how can we in Sweden finance our defense, defense, uh, defense force? Well, we have, we, have, uh, we have gone down quite substantially in the, in the <clears throat> when it comes to the financing of defense over the last 20 years. <clears throat> if we would have been sitting here in 1995, well, it's a bit more than 20 years, we would be close to 3% of GDP. Uh, of uh, uh, for the for the defense we went down and at uh, i think at the lowest level we were at 1.1 or something now we have an objective to go up to two percent of gdp by 2026 and this is what we are doing right now and uh, and the question that was asked how are we doing that well it's a question of priority it's a question of finding the fund the funding and of course that beats um, funding that is not going for for other purposes to be to be honest uh, but right now, situation in Europe is such that this is absolute priority. Thank you very much indeed for, for that detailed uh, uh, outline of, of uh, the EU uh, contribution in the field of security and defence. I think it's true to say that um, there is a lot happening in this area, but that most of uh, our populations are uh, not aware of the EU contribution in the security and defence area. It's, uh, it's something that has been kept uh, quite low key and perhaps needs to be raised. Also, you mentioned Georgia, and I uh, recognize uh, the role you played in Georgia in 2021 on behalf of the of, um, the president of the European Council in brokering an agreement with the with the um, two um, political part the political uh, party with the government there, which which was uh, very welcome. Um, I have a question from uh, the Irish Examiner. Given the recent concerns raised by the Dutch military about the Russian threat to critical cables and energy infrastructure in the North Atlantic, um, is, there a, uh, is this a major issue for Sweden in its presidency? And also, um, do you feel the threat applies to the seas around Western Europe? Uh, and given the difficulties and shortages in the Irish Naval Service, 
uh, is this something that the EU could assist Ireland with? Basically, it's um, the critical cables on energy infrastructure and the threat from Russia, State Secretary. If you so, is this something yeah. that Sweden is is worried and conscious about? Um, yeah, we are very conscious about it. Uh, there was well, we don't know who did it, but uh, you might recall that the uh, there was a major blow up of uh, of the North Stream pipeline in the middle of the Baltic Sea, uh, which I think um, showed the vulnerability of infrastructure as such. Uh, we don't know who did it, so we should be clear on that. Uh, so, so I think that uh, that made it clear for us, at least uh, now I'm talking from a Swedish point of view. That uh, this is issues that we need to take with uh, quite some quite substantive seriousness, uh, which we do. Now, uh, on the question whether we this is something which we are working on within the European Union, the answer is no. It's not part of the of the of what we are what we are discussing. Um, I presume that this is something that the alliance is looking very carefully on, but of course we are not part of the alliance, so I don't know what the discussions are, or what they look like. Well, we do, but. Uh, but uh, this is not the object of the discussion that we're having now today. But uh, the, on the reply on the whether this is an issue for the European Union, it is not for the time being. This is not what we look at. Yes. Thank you for that. Uh, obviously, it's something I think the Irish, um, the Irish view uh, and given the coastline here, this is something that needs to be seriously looked at and taken into account. Um, following on your mention of NATO, I have a question from the colleague in the Department of Foreign Affairs, Michael Tracy. What is the State Secretary's view on Swedish accession to NATO? Will it ultimately succeed? And uh, what time scale you might have for that? And uh, what uh, in, uh, are your views of the objection to the application by Turkey? Well, um, we hope that the uh, that the accession will will happen as soon as possible. <clears throat> now we are we are joining NATO, and it's of course for the NATO members to to agree to that. And um, we have two of the members of the alliance that has not yet ratified. <coughs> we know that. Uh, with one of them, which is Turkey, we had a uh, discussion in at the Madrid summit, uh, which ended in a memorandum of understanding uh, between us, uh, uh, and where. Uh, uh, was also outlined a couple of issues which we work together with. We have done on our side what was uh, called for from that uh, from that um, agreement, and um, so we are now waiting for the ratification by the two countries concerned. I can't say anything about the timeline for that, but uh, clearly it is important. It is important not only for the security of uh, of this part of Europe where Sweden is located. Uh, Sweden and Finland as part of the alliance would substantially strengthen the, the alliance ability uh, for, for defense of its uh, members. Um, but it's also important in terms of uh, strengthening the capabilities of the alliance. Sweden and uh, Finland will both be <clears throat> net contributors to the, to, the, uh, to the alliance when it comes to defense capabilities. And that is beyond the, uh, the geographical uh, theater of uh, of the uh, of the part where Sweden and Finland is located. So, for all these reasons, we hope that there will that we will be able to see become members uh, in the alliance and have the ratifications as soon as possible. Yes, and uh, thank you. Yes, I think we all see see the difficulties and and wish you well in that. I have a question, uh, State Secretary, from Shona Murray, Euronews, and she asks, can you give us some outline of the potential manifestations from the presidency regarding the rule of law in Hungary and Poland in relation to protecting the independence of courts, respect for the ECJ, and values and principles of the EU? Um, this is a, a, a difficult situation for the EU as a whole. Yeah, no, we are we are going to continue uh, the process that has been going on for a couple of years, which is called the Article Seven process. So we will have uh, those um, those hearings uh, in the council uh, with the two countries concerned. Uh, that is going to be the the major element when it comes to Poland and Hungary. Uh, we hope that the issues are being addressed by the two countries so that uh, we can we can close those processes because that would be the best 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 outcome. 
in parallel with that, we will continue the work on, uh, on what, which are a kind of peer uh, examinations between member states uh, as regards the rule of law situation in, in individual member states. And we have, uh, I think, five countries up for our presidency, which we will examine. Uh, so we continue that work. And these are the two major elements that we, we are going to, to have on the agenda. Thank you that that will continue. Uh, moving away in a different direction uh, from uh, Planchet Samuel Kohn, um, obviously the priorities he said of the Swedish presidency refer to the swift and decisive uh, response to the invasion of Ukraine. But his question, in fact, is about Israel and uh, what the EU's response to Israeli violation of international law and human rights abuses have not been swift or decisive. And uh, where does the uh, Swedish presidency stand uh, in relation to um, the uh, situation in Palestine and in Israel? And do you think, uh, this is the main point, do you think that the EU's lack of unity uh, undermines its position in the eyes of uh, the global community in relation to Israel and Palestine? Yeah, no, there we have conclusions uh, which goes back to 2009 on the EU's uh, position when it comes to uh, uh, this issue and um, <clears throat> that, uh, that is favoring a two-state solution and uh, supporting efforts to go in that direction. And, um, and that, <clears throat> that is the way that the presidency will also work on these issues during these six months. Thank you, yes. Uh, another question, we have a lot of questions um, from Mike Coyle. Could the State Secretary comment on the impact of the sanctions against Russia? Have you a sense of, uh, of the impact that they are having in Russia? One reads that uh, their economy is not as bad as we expected. They're receiving help from elsewhere. What is your view, State Secretary, on the impact of the sanctions? Well, I can only refer to uh, those studies that are out there, and um, uh, they seem to indicate that uh, the impact has indeed, indeed been quite substantial for the Russian economy, um, and um, they will continue to be substantial. Uh, the fact that we are not, uh, we have sanctions on important um, uh, input for for uh, the uh, the uh, oil and gas industry. Uh, will in the longer term play or in the medium term or fairly soon play play an even more important role. So there should be no doubt that the the sanctions has played has played an important role from that angle. What is now uh, important as well is to uh, see to that they are not so circumvented uh, and that they are fully respected. And that's something which um, an Irish has a specific role to play, namely David O'Sullivan, who is, uh, uh, has been coming to the EU system again in order to help um, the, the, the EU member states and the institutions to, to see to that the sanctions are being respected. Uh, no, I, so my take is that, and our take is that the sanctions have been very important, not only not as, as, as a symbolic measure, but as a substantive measure. Uh, they have also had a substantive, a substantive effect for individual Russians who have been considered uh, uh, particularly. Uh, I would say uh, uh, being part of the of the efforts when it comes from Russian side when it comes to this uh, unacceptable war against Ukraine. Yes, thank you. yes, David O'Sullivan was stolen from uh, the institute as director general to go to. I know <laughs> to be the um, to be the sanctioned czar. Uh, it's not yes. a, not an easy task, I think, and also there's the intention to set up a. Uh, a permanent unit in the Commission uh, to deal with sanctions, which of course would track yeah. would track sanctions right across the board. Um, yeah. Could I ask you? Um, I have a question that um, uh, I would like to ask you about the uh, migration uh, policy, State Secretary. Uh, it's it's one of the most difficult policies to get uh, to pull together in the EU. It has been for years. There's a resurgence of migration uh, from uh, outside the EU. Uh, it's just very difficult to see how it can be pulled together, given the different attitudes to migrants coming into the EU, and to try and get 
a legal form of migration. Are you optimistic that in the Swedish presidency you could move it forward uh, to try to solve what is a, an extremely difficult issue? Um, all countries have experienced, including our own, a very significant increase. So there is a real demand to to focus in this area. Yeah, no, I I, uh, I think one needs to do a a, um, a distinction between uh, the uh, short term challenge we are facing right now, uh, which is particularly true for uh, I think three member states, uh, and that is Austria, Belgium, and the Netherlands, which over the last couple of months has had uh, a substantive increase of uh, irregular migrants coming into their respective countries. Some of them has the right for international protection, many of them have not. And, uh, and that has created a very strong, I think, wish from member states of uh, looking on, uh, in particular, the external borders and see how they can be strengthened. Uh, that was the result of the latest European Council. And, and the work on that is now going on. It has to do with infrastructure. It has to do with migration management. It has to do with concrete support via Frontex at the border as such. But it also has to do with fighting even, even more efficiently the international organized crime that are administrating this uh, irregular migration from, from countries outside the EU. And finally, it has to do with uh, strengthening the partnership with the countries of source and countries of transit, where it's, uh, on the one hand, helping them to build up the necessary instruments and, and, and administrative capacity to, to handle migration by themselves, controlling their own external border, but also to be clear to them, I'm thinking now in particular countries of source, that our we expect them to uh, readmit their own citizens. And if they don't do that, uh, it will have consequences for our relations. And, uh, and what came out very strongly was this uh, whole government approach, which means that we're not only thinking in terms of migration, but we're also thinking in terms of how does that interplay with visa policy, trade policy, and development policy. I has been worked quite a lot with countries of source and of transit in my previous position. I believe strongly that this is the right way forward, because it's a bit uh, odd that uh, uh, we should that countries from which uh, uh, citizens are coming uh, refuse to to uh, readmit them to them countries when they have no right to be in in the European Union. That is the short term elements <clears throat> that right now are being implemented. Slightly longer term, we have the migration pact. And uh, there I am quite optimistic that uh, member states and European Parliament will be able to land that one in accordance with the roadmap that has been set up. And the roadmap is running from, from now until uh, next year at this time, around this time. Uh, and here, the challenge is to find this balance between, on the one side, responsibility for those countries, for all countries, but in particular for those countries where, where the migration is coming in, and solidarity from those countries within the EU where the pressure is not the same. And I think uh, the elements that the Commission has set out and which are now being negotiated uh, is the right balance, uh, is the right, is the right uh, elements that are there. Now it's time, now the issue is to find the right balance. And in that migration pact, there is also elements of legal migration. Because on the same time as we have this challenge of irregular migration that needs to be handled, um, the challenge of seeing too that we have a functional asylum policy, which lives up to our, our, uh, uh, um, uh, our commitments when it comes to international law. We also need to see too that we have a a policy of legal migration that holds water. And we know that uh, that's an area where we probably will have more of an interest to, to have it functioning as we are looking ahead, given the, the development of our own workforce. So these elements come together in the migration pact. And on your, on your question, or yes, I am cautiously optimistic that uh, this will fall into place. And during the Swedish presidency, we are going to work in particular on 
two elements which has to do with external border. One is the Eurodac, which has to do with the with the uh, information systems as such. And the other element is about screening, which has a link to with the information system, but which makes it more easy and, and uh, more, more, more uh, um, comprehensive when it comes to screening those migrants that comes in over the border when they come over the border. Thank you very much indeed for that comprehensive um, reply. Uh, I think, as I mentioned, that Ireland is struggling as well with, with a significant increase in numbers. So a future path uh, for dealing with, with what is an extremely difficult situation would be, would be very, very helpful. Uh, but, but in your case, in, in your case, it's primarily Ukrainians, isn't it? Uh, no, we have seen a significant increase from uh, uh, arrivals outside Europe. I think at one stage it was reaching, reaching a thousand per week. And uh, oh, yeah. yes, okay. Ukrainians, but uh, uh, that are 70,000 plus, but also a very significant increase in um, in migrants from outside of Europe. And as you say, it's difficult to distinguish uh, between those who are genuine migrants and uh, those who are not requiring um, the treatment as migrants, and that is that is the problem. Um, uh, inevitably, state sector, we've come to a question about EU UK relations. Uh, it's it's uh, you're speaking uh, here in Ireland, and uh, what do you think is the future of EU UK relations? How do you see it? I know Sweden and the UK uh, have been and are particularly close, um, but uh, how do you see the future of the EU UK relations? Well, I mean, uh, I, I don't want to comment on the on the on the Brexit as such, but uh, only perhaps to say that uh, uh, you rightly pointed to that uh, we worked very closely with with the United Kingdom uh, when they were members of the EU, and uh, and it's of course unfortunate that they are not there anymore. But that was a decision by the British people, so that that who who are we to have any views on that? For the future. We have an agreement, and the, the first thing is to see to that that agreement is being respected fully. And that's why the, the uh, discussions on the Northern Ireland Protocol is so essential. And here we stand all together, uh, the, the European Union and its member states. <clears throat> and, the, and my understanding is that um, the, the discussions or negotiations or whatever we should call it between the Commission and the British government is... Uh, how should I put it, is ongoing. And, uh, and, um, and our hope is that they will lead to a, to a result, which, uh, which means that we can come out of that particular, particular issue, which has been there for quite some time now, too long time. So, so that is on the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, and as I said, it's, it's so not, I mean, there is this tendency from time to time to say, well, Northern Ireland Protocol, why is that important? It is absolutely essential. For, for Northern Ireland to be part of the single market, there needs to be guarantees that uh, we can trust whatever comes out of Northern Ireland and goes into the single market. So full respect for that and fully behind the position of the EU uh, from, and, and the unity is very, very strong. For the future, well, there are, there are elements of uh, possible possibilities of developing the agreement uh, that was reached. And to the extent that uh, this is something that is going to uh, be of, of interest for the United Kingdom and for the EU, we would be probably among those who would say that would be a good thing uh, in order to see to that, uh, that uh, we can have, have an even richer relation with, with the United Kingdom outside the EU. But we're not there yet. Let's start now to see to that uh, the, what needs to be addressed needs to be addressed, and that is the Northern Ireland Protocol. Yes, yes, and thank you. And we all have, have high hopes for that um, and hope that that can be uh, can be addressed and we can move forward from that. Uh, the um, security and defence letter uh, that was abrogated, we'd very much like to see, obviously, a security and defence relationship with, with the United Kingdom. Um, State Secretary, you were responsible for quite some time for enlargement. Uh, we have a very large number of um, applicants in the waiting room. How, what is your view about the speed that that is likely to, uh, to move? Obviously, Ukraine has come in with strong moral pressure, uh, Georgia and Moldova there also, but also the Balkan member states who have been waiting for quite some time. 
Uh, could I have you the view of, of you, uh, your view and the presidency view as to how it might move or will there be quite a long lag? Well, I think the, the process as such is, is uh, well known and well understood. It's merit-based and therefore it's linked to the ability of the countries concerned to take on the, the uh, rather challenging uh, commitments that you need to put in place to become a member of the EU. And, and uh, it's both the technical ones, which are by themselves quite substantive, but uh, it is also what we call the fundamentals, which is the... Uh, uh, guarantee institutions that, uh, or rather institutions that guarantee democracy, rule of law, respect for minorities. Uh, and uh, on that one, I think uh, all of all the countries concerned are working very hard uh, in order for that to happen. And uh, But there are still issues that need to be addressed. That goes for Western Balkan, that goes also for Ukraine. I mean, there were seven conditions that were put uh, when they got the candidate status. It's true for Moldova and it's true for Georgia. Now, uh, uh, when they are able to move ahead, the process will move ahead. And therefore, it's very difficult to say anything about timelines. But what I have observed is that there is a, I think, um, has always been an openness from member states for the enlargement process. Every year, this has been manifested in, uh, manifested in, uh, in conclusions from the, from the council, uh, uh, when on the enlargement. So that, that has always been there, the political commitment that EU is a, will enlarge when the countries are ready to become members of the EU. But what I think one sense now is that there has been, been more of a stronger priority to these issues. Uh, and that, I think, has to do with what we have seen, the Russian war, but also the way that the world has developed and a recognition that... Uh, for the EU, it is essential that uh, these uh, countries who would like to become members of the EU and who happens to be our neighbours, that they can develop in that direction. Uh, if I put it bluntly, it's like uh, previous commissioner put it, we have a choice of exporting stability or importing instability. And there is something in it. Uh, and I wouldn't say that that goes for all of them, but there's something in it. And stability by moving towards becoming members of the EU is, is uh, probably true uh, in terms of uh, putting the various structures in place. So that's, that's how I see it. Uh, I also, I just had a meeting today, in fact, with ambassadors from the Western Balkan countries here in Sweden. And it's very clear that there is a determination on their side to, to move ahead. And uh, I was last week in Kiev. It's uh, very clear that the decisiveness of the Ukrainians to move in this direction and wanting to, to do the necessary forms in that way going forward in the accession process. So that's where we are. And, uh, and I think we will see over the coming years that uh, this issue will be on the agenda and hopefully we will see further progress from the countries concerned and thereby them moving forward to moving closer towards the EU. Um, uh, and but the timeline is something that is be going to be decided by their ability to take on the the, um, the commitments that are called for. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that. I suppose one can say that that's uh, from an awful situation, a war situation. There is something positive, uh, more of a gathering uh, of views that uh, uh, in in the European direction rather than just coasting along as, as things have been going. Um, State Secretary, we are very close to the end. Just one last question. What do you see as the biggest challenge to the single market? We are 30 years now in the single market and um, Sweden is a big trading nation. What do you, what would you see as the single biggest challenge for the single market? Well, to, to see you that the single market continues to be a single market. And uh, what it means in concrete terms is to continuously address the temptation by member states to put into place various kinds of uh, measures that de facto is going to run contrary to the single market. And that is everything from uh, abuse of state aid to uh, various forms of, uh, of legislation, which uh, happens to be designed in such a way that there are particularly friendly towards uh, 
the production from the country in the country itself. And this, this temptation is there at all levels. It could be at the local level, it could be also at the regional level. So that's, that I think is one element which is important. I would like to mention another one, and that is to continue to develop the single market. And that means being able to see to that the digital environment that we are going to live in may also means a single market that is not only in name, but also in substance. It means services seriously becoming a single market for services, which has been a very big challenge over the last, over the last couple of years. And finally, I think we all need to reflect on the legislation and the legislative burden. There is also always a temptation to go for legislative um, uh, instruments in order to address uh, issues that are coming up. But when doing that, seeing to that it doesn't become another layer on a layer on a layer, which leads to Europe and European industry being less, less, uh, um, uh, less, less able to, uh, to compete, but also less able to uh, create that prosperity and economic growth that is underpinning our system, underpinning democracy and rule of law, and which is essential for us to be able to, to uh, project in order to stand up against these other systems that are around and that, uh, that we are de facto uh, competing with today to an extent that was not the case a couple of years ago. So here you have a bit how I see the, into the single market. Yes, that's a very good um, that's very good advice, I think, to each of the member states uh, to look at things and uh, also the layers upon layers of uh, bureaucracy that certainly in, in a number of areas inhibit productivity, which we do need to look at compared to other areas and other trading trading blocks. Um, certainly from an Irish point of view, we would welcome um, services and digital uh, added on. Uh, and uh, uh, we wish you well in, in trying to bring that forward. Uh, State Secretary Danielson, thank you so much for giving your time at, uh, at this, uh, as I say, challenging time for the Swedish presidency. We wish you um, uh, the best of um, good luck isn't the correct word, but we wish you that all the efforts of the presidency, which we can see already are considerable, will bear fruit during the six months. Uh, I know you have on the 1st of June the European um, political community as well to cope with uh, and the 47 um, member states there. So our good wishes go to you um, and uh, for a very successful presidency in a difficult situation. Thank you again for joining us. And uh, well, Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to members who are joining us. Uh, bye bye for the moment. We'll be seeing you again.